everyone and welcome to another episode of Confabulating and if you're yet to join us um, a very happy new year. It's our great pleasure to be joined tonight by Professor Leslie Smith of Harris Manchester College who will be speaking on the subject of the Bible in the medieval world. Leslie is a professor of medieval intellectual history and a fellow of politics and senior tutor at Harris Manchester College who previously studied at LSE, Oxford and the Pontifical Institute for Medieval Studies in Toronto. She's written a number of books and articles from 1992 to 2020 on a wide range of topics, including theological manuscripts, the Glossa Ordinaria, medieval Bible studies, motherhood, religion and society, and early scholastic teaching. Her most recent book, uh, published in 2014, is entitled The Ten Commandments, Interpreting the Bible in the Medieval World. And she's also recently completed an experimental bibliography experimental biography, I beg your pardon, of William of Auvergne, um, Bishop of Paris and 13th century scholar with the working title, Fragments of the World, William of Auvergne and his medieval life. And her current research interests include medieval intellectual history, the Bible in the Middle Ages and medieval manuscripts, with a particular interest on how the Bible was studied, those who studied it, uh, manuscripts, commentaries, the link between source material and knowledge, as well as relationships between Christian and Jewish communities in the Middle Ages. Leslie, thank you very much for joining, this e for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to have you. A pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Um, so, um, as I say, we can discuss, we can continue the conversation however you like. We can do a QA, and a or if you want to talk for a bit and introduce the topic, um, it's entirely up to you. The space is sort of yours. Um, well, to tell you the truth, I think when um, uh, when I was asked to do it, I I, I I was told it was going to be a sort of Q and A. So I was assuming that, that you would have questions, and I would happily try and do my best to provide some answers. So you know, no uh, problem. Away if you like. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. We can, yep, we can absolutely um, continue with that format. Yeah. So um, I suppose I'll start with a more kind of broad um, introductory question to the topic. Um, which is, um, yeah, sort of how was the, um, how was the Bible kind of studied and thought about um, in the medieval world? And yeah, perhaps um, how were its interpretations different to the kind of interpretations that we would think about today? That's a big question. Um, the Bible was everywhere in the medieval world. It's ubiquitous and it's ubiquitous in a way that um, is, is, is not just, um, consciously ubiquitous as it were but people knew images and phrases and texts and pictures from the bible and that was just part of their consciousness and that didn't mean to say you had to be a believer it's just that the bible was everywhere and um the church was everywhere and so listening to the stories being taught the stories from childhood seeing pictures hearing sermons hearing people talk about those things they just become part of how people imagine the world and how people use language about the world so the bible is 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 everywhere um i study the period when the Bible is moving from being something that monks do in monasteries in order to become better monks, if you like. They read and they study between themselves to, um, to when people start to turn it into a university subject. So how do you take something that has been something for personal development about your own spirituality, about your own salvation, for getting to see God? And how do you turn that into a subject that you can examine and have a curriculum for and, and, and use as part of a university degree in the same way that you might get a degree in law or you might get a degree in medicine? And so they're trying to think through that shift across. How can you do that? And, um, and one of the ways they do that is they try and think about what it is you need to study and at what point you need to study it, uh, what books you need to study those sorts of things, what would count as a qualification, who is allowed to teach, whether you can charge for teaching. That's quite an interesting question, you know, because if you're teaching about God, is it right to ask money for that kind of thing? Um, and that's, that's something they have to think hard about. Um, and also the, the, the people who are doing this are facing um, criticism from, if you like, the old school who think that actually this isn't what the Bible's for. You can't talk about it in the marketplace. Bernard, Bernard Clever says, you know, you can't talk in the, about it in the marketplace as though it's the price of fish. You know, this is something special. So you shouldn't be doing this in these circumstances. So it's that shift across that, it, it, that, that is part of what I study, I suppose. And my particular interest is in 
the materiality of that as well. What that change of view, that change of attitude to how we look at the Bible does for the books, the actual physical manuscripts that people are working with. And, and hence the, the work I've done on the Glossa Ordinaria, but also books of different kinds of commentary, of pastoral manuals, of confessors manuals and preaching materials, um, all those sorts of things of what it is you need to actually physically produce in order to teach people how to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yes, I remember um, studying as an undergraduate, this sort of really interesting shift when universities came onto the scene for the first time, the papacy mm -hmm. became really important, mm -hmm. the whole sort of Christian world became a lot more sort of legalistic and mm -hmm. committed to the written word. And I think that's really fascinating that mm -hmm. it has that kind of effect and it really shifts and moulds um, religion across all areas of society. Um, I wanted to ask um, off the back of that, and particularly with regards to materiality, um, when people sort of studied and read and interacted with the Bible, what exactly were they sort of interacting with? Was it like a book or a manuscript or something like that? And what kind of effect did that have on kind of the way that people interacted with it? Well, uh, that's a gigantic question, of course, because most people didn't see the book at all. And when they interacted with the Bible, what they interacted with was probably a spoken text, the, the text that they heard people either read out loud or they heard them preach about. Um, it, it, it was oral. And of course, much of the Middle Ages until sort of I don't know, middle of the 13th century, something like that. It, it, most of the Middle Ages is still oral teaching. Certainly the 12th century, you know, you've got oral schools and people go to hear people. They go to listen, not necessarily to see what they've written. They, they want to hear them talk. That's really important. So from the majority of people, their interaction with the Bible is going to be oral. But um, for the people who are studying um, that's quite that's that's really an interesting question that we don't necessarily know the answer to because it, it, in the 12th century maybe it's still only the the tutor the the, the professor as it were who has a copy either of the bible or, or the gloss which is the bible with various kinds of explanations written around it in lots and lots of volumes or there was perhaps a reference volume that people could go and look at. And it's only a bit later on that people start to have their own copies of things. I mean, you know, late 12th century to have a decent private library might mean only having a dozen books. And that was still quite, you know, a, a decent private library. Um, so it's again, it's that shift across from teaching by talking to teaching by reading. And it's one of the things I've studied, particularly with the gloss, is to, to how the, the changing layout of the gloss also shows you that, that change from, from, from having an oral classroom, if you like, to having a classroom where people go and they, they look at this as a reference text and they come back and talk about it when they've seen it as a reference text. But those things, are you, they're fascinating to me, I think, and they're really interesting because you have to sort of tease them out from the material you know the material doesn't say to you oh by the way you know I'm I'm being used in this way now you know you have to sort of think well why has that happened and why does it look different and who could use this in this way what how who could read text this small you know you can't do it on the hoof as it were you must be sort of stopping and looking and reading carefully and then coming back whereas the you know the earlier copies where the text is big and it's simple to have it on your knee and read from it then you think okay well this is more something that you could actually use in the classroom as part of a talk, as part of a discussion. So, so those are all sorts of things that I'm really interested by and, and try and prize from the, the actual physical materials. Mm -hmm, absolutely. That's, um, yeah, thank you. That's really, really interesting stuff. It always astounds me. You see some of these sort of manuscripts and you can see that, one, they're incredibly tiny, but also it's extraordinary how even the space itself, you'll have kind of... Um, script going sort of vertically you'll have no spaces at all it's all enormously compact and almost kind of squashed on top of each other um with lots of kind of in sort of implementations and things like that and it makes me think like how on earth could anybody have used this how could you sort of sit down and work with something like this do we have an indication about um that at all and what those sort of particular types of manuscripts were used for 
I think it's it varies. I mean, there are some books we know belong to particular people and we can see them sort of, I don't know, altering them to, to work for themselves, you know, to add things and change things and use color or to use little links, you know, to show that this column is meant to link for, and they add those things in so they know where they're going or they add, of course, you know, maniculi, little pointing fingers, that kind of thing. Um, it's, but but those are, I think those things are still tricky to do. And, 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 and I think that, um, uh, but but uh, for particular manuscripts. But on the other hand, the extraordinary thing about the Glossa Ordinaria is that we have hundreds and hundreds of volumes, um, which are pretty standard. They're not standard in, um, they're standard in their text. So it's an incredible 12th century feat of mass production. And when you think this is being done entirely by hand by a whole group of often not linked um, scribes at all who are working independently, and yet they manage to produce this same text over and over and over again, writing by hand. Um, that's, an, that's, a, that's an amazing feat. How did they do that? And how did they standardize it? It's, it's incredible. And that's, you know, it's another thing that until the advent of printing, you'd think wouldn't be possible. And yet here it is, you know, something that is, is extant in, you know, a whole copy of the Gospel Ordinaria for the entire Bible was 21 or 22 volumes. And yet these things are mass produced in the Middle Ages. It's, it's, it's an incredible feat of sort of graphic skill and visualization, I think. Hmm. Well, it, 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 it absolutely blows your mind. I think, you know, especially in an age where, you know, you can just so easily like sort of digitalize and print things and things like that to imagine like all of these monks just sort of sitting there and painstakingly. Uh, they're not monks. That's the point. They're oh, not monks. It's oh, not like usually. Funny. No, no, no. It's not usually monks. Well, what's, what's interesting about this is that we're largely in an age of commercial publication. These are commercial secular publish, pu publishers who are producing this. Yeah. And that's really interesting as well. You know, it's monks, yeah, they do it a bit, but actually when usually when monastic houses want to copy, they had to hire a special scribe because they realized how complicated this was. And so you need somebody who's got an extraordinarily sort of visual uh, visual creativity who can imagine what it's going to look like on a page and actually then do it, make it work on a page. And, and uh, as you say, I mean, you know, it, when we've got sort of computer aided publication and you just take text and you can move it around the screen and you can add things in, you know, it all seems it's extraordinary, but they're actually doing it. And of course, if they make a mistake, it's a disaster. You know, what's what's interesting about these manuscripts is that so rarely do you find pages that have just gone extremely wrong, you know, where it just doesn't work anymore. <laughs> they they really can do it. But 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 they they realized as well that they, they needed people who had particular gifts to make this work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, with that being said, I have a question also. Uh, so. We already know that the Bible was hand copied in the Middle Ages. And my question is, do you think that uh, with that, somehow we kind of lost the, the true essence of the Bible? Uh, because we often know that copies were adulterated, some parts were omitted, and even there were even some mistakes of translation. Do you think that uh that was kind of that the DSS was lost or do you think that the true essence of the bible is that we have now oh i think they are desperately keen to get it right really? they, they, yeah i mean yes absolutely really really keen to get it right um and, and 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 the place we can see this most strongly is at the very beginning of the 13th century with the Dominicans, with the Dominican order in Paris, because um, the Dominicans want to produce um, standardized texts that they can produce in small, small formats so that Dominican friars can have them in their pockets, basically, or hanging from the belts of their habits. And they can go on their, you know, preaching missions, they can walk across Europe, and they all have the same Dominican Bible. And so the Dominicans 
take extreme care, first of all, to learn the languages, you know, or some of the earliest linguistic schools in the high Middle Ages are Dominican schools because they, they want to learn biblical languages. And then they want to, to make sure that they've all got the same thing. So they produce lists of correctoria, things where they know it's gone wrong, to, to, so, so that they can actually put it right. They compare, they, they gather together the oldest texts that they can find and they compare them together to try and figure out which text is the right text. And I think they go to really serious lengths to try and get this right. And so you can see very clearly in manuscripts where things have been corrected or where there are lists at the back or where there are indexes of things so that they can they can produce the best text they possibly can. Yeah, it's, it's really important to them. So it was kind of, uh, they had a lot of pride on what they're, what they're doing, right? Oh, abs absolutely. <laughs> yeah, they really do. Yeah, they really do. And sometimes with the gloss, the gloss goes through, the gloss ordinaria goes through two probably maybe more revisions and 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 I've certainly found copies of the gloss where people have gone through very carefully and brought them up to date modernized them made sure that they've got the proper readings and that the readings um you know are, are, are link to the the best version that they know at the moment so yes they're incredibly scholarly oh, that's that's something I don't know if Peter has a question. I personally uh, have one again. So uh, the topic of the illuminations on these Bibles, do you think that we can consider these Bibles a true art form because they're, there are absolutely beautiful illuminations on these manuscripts? And uh, uh, what I'm trying to, say, uh, to ask is that do you think that uh, this is truly an art form, the illuminations? My husband's an art historian, so I can just sort of, you know, I could, I can hear his hackles rising about, you know, what true art form might mean. Um, you know, and I suppose he, you know, he would, if he were sitting here, he'd say, well, what do you mean by that? You know, and it must be. Um, uh, why wouldn't they be an art form? I mean, they are stunning. I mean, absolutely fascinating. And it's it's also, I suppose, we, I mean, what's interesting to me now is that Bibles aren't illustrated. Isn't that interesting now that, you know, actually there generally aren't pictures in Bibles, you know? That's <laughs> kind very of, interesting. Why, you know, we've sort of put it the other way around. We expect it to look dull. We expect it to just look like text, you know, but they imagine it in different ways. Um, yeah, they lost the charm. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. But but also the thing is that you know we have often got used to seeing pictures at particular points in medieval Bibles, and we forget, I think, that um, that those those points and the way those pictures were illustrated were also choices. You know they, that they choose to illustrate particular points of the biblical text and in particular ways, and um, and and we sometimes forget that those are particularly they're particular theological choices. And we see them there. I mean, one example is you know the difference between sort of French and English illustrations in the Psalms, exactly. which are different. You know, kind of, and 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 you think, well, you know, what is it that makes that? Why did they make those choices? Why does that work? You know, so um, so so I think that it's certainly an art form. It's certainly art, I suppose. Um, but it's more than, as it were, just decoration. I mean, uh, that may, may actually be true of all medieval art, but again, my husband isn't here, so I can say this, but that it's, it's never just a picture. It's never just decoration. It's always sort of something exeg exegetical at the same time. It's always giving you something more than, than just a, you know, decoration it's always it's always giving you something to think about I think. Exactly. yeah thank you very much uh peter brilliant thank you very much for that yes it's um really interesting stuff um i think we've gone to some length to talk about um how important it was to get the text sort of absolutely correct so it could be sort of reproduced and sent to other people um but i suppose i'd be interested to know i imagine inevitably there were kind of clashes um about different theological points or interpretations in the glossary or denaria. 
Um, what were the kind of big clashing points and kind of discussions in theology? Um, yeah, and sort of how were they resolved? Oh, oh, well, oh. <laughs> um, well, where do we start, really? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, the big sort of 12th century discussion is on the meaning of the Eucharist. And, you know, that that's what's it about and what do we do with it? You know, and, 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 and that's just a that's just giant. You know, what's there? Um, but there are all sorts of there are surprisingly large holes that you would think had been sorted out, but hadn't, you know, um, still in the 12th century, how many sacraments they are and what the sacraments are, what counts as a sacrament and what doesn't. You, you, you kind of would have thought that had been sorted out by the 12th century, but it hasn't. They're still working those things out. In the 13th century, you get big discussions on the beatific vision, what it means to actually know God. <laughs> That's, again, something you might think that people had worked out, but surprisingly it wasn't. And, and then, of course, in the 13th century as well, particularly with Franciscan and Dominicans of, of, of mendicant orders who are, are, are pastorally sort of, you know, actually working close to ordinary people and moving around, then th the issues become sort of issues of, 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 of your own moral choices. You know um, what you should do in certain conditions. What counts as a sin? What can be forgiven as a sin? You know what's really bad. What isn't really bad? You know how how we um, how we forgive people. What confession is, and how people. I, I, I did some interesting work. I mean, I thought it was interesting um, because I, I was more interesting than I thought it was going to be on um, extreme unction. You know the last rites. A, a few years ago. And, and again, I thought that, you know, this was pretty simple and everybody by the 13th century would have sorted out what the last rites are. But it turns out that there was still a big debate about what it was you're trying to do. So is the last rites, do they think it's actually going to heal somebody? Do you give somebody the last rites, not as their last thing, but actually as something that will heal them? I just as though, and they use this analogy, just like a doctor coming with medicine. So do you instantly call the priest and does the priest come and, 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 um, and, and, and anoint you and you expect to get better from that? Or in fact, should you think of it as the last thing? You know, it's too late now, you're not going anywhere. And if you have this, this is, this is the last thing you can have. You can't have it again. You know, and it makes a change in your life that you're stuck at that point, which is very like the sort of cathar consolamentum. You know, once you've had the consolamentum as a cathar, then you're not supposed to have sex, you're not supposed to eat meat, you know, you're supposed to live a good life and you can't do it again. So that it's, it's very interesting that that's a, a live question. You know, can you have the last rites more times than one? Or does the last rites mean that actually your life has changed and you're stuck having to be behave in a different way? And that's a really interesting discussion between mendicants and non-mendicants in the 13th century. So there are, there are a whole pile of, of, of surprisingly live issues that they're still kind of tussling over and trying to work out, I think, yeah. That's really extraordinary. Like, um, I suppose in my ignorance, I assumed that sort of as the church was becoming more influential and sort of answering more decreasals, that these would have almost been sort of party lines with maybe just a few dissenters who got sort of thrown out. But it's extraordinary to think that this was still a kind of I yeah, know kind it's of like still a really lively. live discussion. Yeah, it's certainly lively. And, and one of the really interesting things too is to see the particularly the the, the sort of masters in the schools. Um, know that there are some things you can talk about amongst yourselves and particularly orally you know you can talk about these things in the classroom and you can say oh what do you think about this and oh, I think it might be best this that but you don't write it down because mm -hmm. once you've written it down it's sort of stuck you know and and even the pope knows that there's one point at which innocent the third says well if you ask me as the pope I can tell you this but actually if you ask me as the scholar I could say to you this, this, and this. And there is a particular manuscript of Peter Lombard where somebody has written in the margin, um, but in the classroom, he went further. <laughs> and I think, you know, those are, so we can actually see and imagine, you know, a, a person teaching and, and those debates that you can have amongst, 
uh, amongst fellow professionals, even if those fellow professionals are students still, but you can have those, oh, we all know we can talk about this kind of debate that you don't actually say when you're talking to the laity or when you're writing it down for parish priests who might not be very educated to sort of do, then you have to be much more careful, then you have to hold back a bit, you know, you have to know where you are. But we can sort of definitely see them feeling their way to different positions when they're talking amongst themselves. Yeah, I see, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I suppose, what I'd be right in thinking then, that, that sort of puts the written words, um, it sort of gives it a certain status in the sense that, you know, when you're discussing something, it's still very open, you know, it's still kind of open to discussion and debate. But as soon as you write it down, it's almost as if it's set in stone. It's sort of the canon now. And as soon as that's in place, you know, people are going to follow it. They're going to disseminate it. And if the wrong thing gets out, then potentially, you know, that's ruinous if you're offending God by doing something fundamentally wrong in terms of your liturgy or your kind of preaching and not just offending god also but, but of course perhaps you know is it were um, getting yourself into hot water getting yourself into trouble you know um he wrote that down you know he said that you know and we see that a bit in the 12th century with abelard you know who's you know brings all these books to say no i didn't and bernard who brings all these books to say oh yes you did you know all those kinds of things you know so you've got to be You've got to be careful what you write down, yes, because people can point to it, you know, whereas you can say, oh, you know, we just see this in modern politics all the time at the moment, you know, you said that, well, no, you didn't, you know, it's kind of, he didn't really mean it, you know, it's kind of thing, but but actually, if you've written it down, then then people can pull it out and point to it and say, but yes, you did, and that's that's a tricky situation, yeah. That's fascinating. I suppose it's, um, I suppose, you know, we almost think of it as like, it's a very modern thing that if you, you know, if you say something or you write something down and it's online, it's going to stick with you and that's right. going to tarnish your reputation. But it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's just amazing that like even back then they had the same yeah. problem. But as soon as you write something down a manuscript, it's out there forever and it can be... So it, <laughs> was like, it was like, be careful of what you say, but be even more careful in what you write. <laughs> Yeah, because they're not being recorded, of course, you know, they're not, you know, they're not on social media forever, you know, that kind of thing. But but as soon as they write it down and sort of allow it to be circulated, which is one of the reasons why, you know, so many of the people we know who were great teachers, you know, have reputations as great teachers. Actually, we don't have enormous amounts of their written material because they were careful not to write things down. And also because... Um, the only way you could make a living was by people coming and hearing you, students coming and hearing you and paying to hear you. Well, if you've written that book down, you know, this is in the years before copyright. This is in the years before, you know, kind of you get money from authors, you know, royalties and that kind of thing. If the book is out there, then you aren't going to make any money by people coming to hear you because you've already written down everything you're going to say. So people often until the very end of their careers or sometimes their students posthumously would actually write up the notes they had or you know notes which had been approved but which nevertheless weren't formally out there they would write them up and then they would be circulated so it makes again it makes us trying to think through who was saying what when we don't have everything that clearly they were working on it it makes it a difficult thing to do okay uh, professor we have a question from facebook uh, Tiago Pereira asks, are there major differences between the Latin and Greek translations of the Bible? Um, uh, yes and, and no, um, there are. Um, but again, it's one of the things that from Jerome onwards, um, one of the things he's trying to do is, is smooth out those differences. Yeah, but it's, it is also true. I mean, William of Auvergne, whom I've been working on for a while. William is very aware. One of the things that's really fascinating about William is he's aware of the power of language and language making a world, not just reporting a world, but making a world. And William says things like, you know, those ideas aren't the same in that 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 language as they are in this language. It's not just the words aren't the same, but the ideas aren't the same in that language. So, you know, he says about Aristotle at one point, he says, um, well, you know, he probably wasn't saying quite that because that's just not how the Greek works. 
and in, and in the meantime, he's getting Aristotle through Arabic and then translated from that back to Latin, you know, and he's very aware that the translation is not just about language, it's about ideas. And, and so trying to smooth those concepts out is something that they're, you know, that trans, medieval translators are, are, are aware of and, and try to become more and more sophisticated about, yeah. So. So it was kind of like translation was a very important thing and it was very methodical. Uh, Peter, I know if you have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I suppose one thing I'll be interested to kind of follow on from that discussion is that um, obviously another sort of effect of having universities on the rise was the fact that you were suddenly getting all of these kind of um, ideas coming in from the Greek, from the Arabic, mm -hmm. um, lots of kind of contact uh, between the Islamic and the Christian worlds. And so I suppose one thing which I'll be really interested to know, and I hope you'll forgive me, this is perhaps a slightly broad question. Um, we've already touched on kind of a question of translation and trying to get the sort of essence of ideas in and getting it right. Um, but yeah, do you sort of, um, do you get the sense in this period that this resurgence of kind of Greek ideas and exposure to things like say the Quran and Latin um, is having an impact on the way that people are thinking about and studying the Bible? Oh, definitely. Um, and I'll give you um, a, a nice example from William of Auvergne. Um, just because he's, he, as it happens, I've, I've, I've just been uh, rereading something um, this past week and it's back in my mind. William is one of the very earliest readers of Avicenna. You know, commentator on Aristotle, and in fact, most much of, of Aristotle in the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages, high Middle Ages, this point anyway, is is through Avicenna. Is not really Aristotle mm -hmm. at all. And William is very taken by Avicenna. He he really regards him highly as a philosopher. He 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 speaks very highly of him, even though he's a Muslim. And he, you know, in in that terms, he knows that Avicenna, you know, how how could he be so foolish as to understand to think Islam is right? But on the other hand, my goodness, he's a clever philosopher, and and William's you know, admiring of that. But Avicenna commonly speaks of God as um, as creator, or particularly just primus first yeah and and he also has a little phrase for god which is um he necessarily he's necessarily is as it were he, it, it's it uses the little latin phrase but god is the thing that necessarily is god is, is if you like the essence of being um, the essence of just existence and what's interesting is that over time we watch william and william adopts these names for God as well. So he stops calling God, as it were, just God very often. And he refers to God very often as just primus. And he does it because I think he realizes that somehow primus is, is a concept and, and an idea of a God that it's very hard that anybody can accept, as it were, anybody who's prepared to accept a God, as it were, and even those who are on the, you know, the, the kind of really sort of edges of accepting a God can see that there might be a first, there might be a first thing. And there might also be something, you just have to look around the world, he says, and you see that the world is just teeming with creation. So you can see that this isness, this whatever brings this is into being, has got to be itself somehow isness. It's got to be being. And so to, to call God the thing that necessarily is, is something that a large number of people, whether they be Jews or whether they be Muslims or whether they be Christians or whether they be heterodox or orthodox or pagans, all sorts of people, he says, they can understand that concept and they can see where that concept is. And I think that's absolutely fascinating that somebody in the first half of the 13th century is prepared to think that broadly about what the Christian God might also encompass and how you might actually, what language you might use about the Christian God and how that might an, an allow you to, as it were, he doesn't want to make friends of, of Jews and Muslims, obviously, I mean, you know, but, um, but nevertheless, how it might allow you to have a conversation with them, to meet them at some point. 
and I just think that's extraordinary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. That's yeah, it's really remarkable yeah. stuff. I suppose. Yeah, so, sorry, Carlos. So it kind of set an opener to to talks to to peace uh, on a on a time that talking to Muslims and and Jews was was a very uh, a very risky thing, you know. Mm. Uh, He's read it all. I mean, William is, um, I think, the first person in the, in the theology schools to quote Maimonides. And, um, and he's read, he knows Maimonides very well. He, he's read this. He knows the Quran. He's, he knows Avicenna extremely well. He is reading Aristotle when technically he shouldn't really be reading Aristotle. You know, it's, it's not actually the really allowed. And yet he believes that if you're going to talk to people, if you're going to actually have some kind of, you know, obviously he wants to persuade, but he thinks if you're going to do that, then there's no point in just preaching to the converted, literally, you know, that you have to understand and you have to understand them on their terms so that you can make what he calls proofs and evidences in terms that they will be able to accept, that, that they will understand that you're trying to speak their language as well. Well, uh, you talked about Aristotle. Uh, do you think that Thomas of Aquinas was very important to incorporating uh, ancient thoughts to to the medieval ones? You know, because it was kind of like uh, I want was, was was not very common. Mm -hmm. And do you think that Thomas of Aquinas was a, a central figure? Because he brought the he brought the ancients to to the new version of Christianity, right? Well, I, I mean, of course, Thomas is central. Yes, of course, he is. Um, but he's not the first. I mean, you know, William is 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 certainly the first in many occasions. Um, and there are other people before Thomas who are using Alexander of Hales, Philip the Chancellor. There are other people who are doing it as well. Um, I think why. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, they're all interested in Aristotle just because Aristotle is so much part of the liberal arts curriculum, you know, so they, they, they know Aristotle and some, suddenly they've got more Aristotle and they're just fascinated. And, um, but Thomas is, why is Thomas so successful? Thomas is successful, I think, for various reasons. One is that he's a very seductive writer. You know, Thomas, <laughs> but Thomas, Thomas has got the gift of making complicated things seem Sim simple. And he partly does that, of course, by ignoring many of the difficult questions, you know, but you kind of don't notice that he's done that until you're past it. You know, you're thinking, oh, yes, that's very nice. And then you think, but hang on, you know, just a minute there, you know, what have you done here? But Thomas has got that great gift of, of, of clarity and straightforwardness and, you know, the way he puts it all out dialectically. So it looks very good. So Thomas seems to make it acceptable I think as well but you know but Thomas is important too because he's got the whole Dominican order behind him exactly you know <laughs> and that's not to be um underestimated you know, because by this point sort of mid 13th century um how are you going to get your works how are you going to get your books circulated who's going to know you know and for the secular the secular theologians like William and, and you know and, and a number of others, um, they don't have a sort of machine behind them. But the the again the mendicants and particularly the Dominicans because their organisation is so good and because they're you know part of their whole rationale is is study. Um, they have a machine for copying these things out, for circulating them, for making sure, I was talking about the Bibles before, the Dominican Bible, that they want to be standardized across the order. Everybody should have a copy who needs it. And so, so Thomas has just got a great machine copying and circulating and promoting all of the things that he, he says. And, and it's not that Thomas isn't good, he is good, but Sometimes Thomas closes down questions as well because he likes a nice, neat answer. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and so sometimes those questions don't get opened up again until quite a lot later in time. Um, so Thomas, yes, great, but Thomas also in some ways, you know, he likes it the way he likes it, nice and neat. But some of the early, particularly 12th century and early 13th century theologians 
I like them because it's messier. You know, you can see you can see that they're grappling with these really difficult questions. Whereas Thomas sort of, you know, you think, well, well is that easy? Why has nobody sort of spotted it before? <laughs> you know, and it is because he's a great mind, but it's also because he's very careful in what he doesn't discuss, as well as the things that he does discuss. I think. So <clears throat> maybe one of the reasons that he he was so su successful is that probably he was he, he had a great sponsor. He Maybe. did. He absolutely did. That's right. One of the things not to forget, though, as well, is that um, while he was alive, and, and certainly after just after his death, lots of other theologians disputed with Thomas. You know, it wasn't that everybody else said, oh, yes, well, well done. You know, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, in 1277, you know, some of Thomas's um, conclusions are, are actually banned. Yeah, um, it, it, there are things that Thomas says that are wrong. Um, you know, that that part of the more complicated story is often forgotten. It, it, it takes, it's a little longer before Thomas is fully accepted as being the doctor of the church and, and, and being part of the powerful Dominican order. That's quite a lot of the story, I think, there. Well... Uh, Peter, I don't know if you have a question. Brilliant, yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for that. So, um, one thing that I'd be interested to learn a bit more about um, in terms of the methodology of actually researching all of this, um, I understand sort of now that one of the challenges is actually reconstructing the gaps where perhaps, you know, people have discussed things but not written them down, or mm. I don't know, there have been things written down but it's been later amended or corrected mm. or something like that. Um, yeah, just out of curiosity, I think you perhaps um, touched on this a bit already, but um, how do you actually go about um, filling in those gaps where you can see perhaps there's been, you know, a discussion or something like that, but the evidence um, isn't necessarily forthcoming with it? Yes, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I, there are times when I do feel about this as though what you get from them is the punchline, but they haven't told you the joke. You know, and you think everybody else knows that there's something really important here, but what's going on? You know, why? Why did they think there was? So um, one of the things to do is try and read around the same questions in a number of other theologians. You know, what did X say about this? What did Y say about this? What does Z say about this? To see if you can fill in some of the jigsaw pieces from the questions that other people ask. Um, one of my favorites is Hugh of Saint-Cher. Hugh of Saint-Cher is, is often very good. It's sort of giving you, that's one of the reasons I think Hugh may have trained as a lawyer before he became a theologian, is that, you know, he sort of likes to put it down nice, gives you the background a bit. You know, so even if you're looking at somebody earlier, you can get to Hugh and somehow Hugh will sketch out what the, the real sort of, issues behind it might have been but at other times you you just have to try and imagine it you know why might they think that this is an interesting question why might this be a, a, a bother to them you know, talking about extreme unction there was a an issue I think it was with was it with Thomas Chob and William of Ozera? I've forgotten which one but they're very interested to say even after you've had the last rites you can have sex And that seemed like a really strange thing to say, you know, why on earth are they saying this? You know, kind of what's what's going on here? You know, this seems to come out of left field, really. And but the answer clearly came that it has to be to do with dualists. It's got to be to do with with dualist heretics and cathars, you know, because they're saying, no, once you've achieved this level of sort of rightness, then, you know, you, you, you can't be a fleshly thing anymore. You, you're somehow a spiritual thing and you can't go backwards into, into fleshliness. And, um, and, and I, I think it might have been William, not Thomas, but he, that he's saying, um, no, no, that's perfectly all right. You know, even if you've had the last rites, you can still have sex. You know, it's still okay because, because Orthodox Christianity, you know, doesn't say you've moved to this and you don't have to move that. But But trying to figure out, you know, why on earth is this a comment? Why on earth is this an issue? I mean, it's the fun of it, but it can also be, you know, the kind of yeah, frustration because you think, oh, if only I had this, if only I knew that, if only he'd said this little thing, then I've been able to work it out. Yeah. But it is the fun of it. 
Definitely. I suppose it's almost sort of like um, unraveling all of the kind of strands and initially kind of figuring out like, you know, why did they come to blows over this? And like, why yeah. did this suddenly become an issue? And maybe like a few years before, yeah. everybody had everything um, in line. Ex- exactly. Exactly. You know, this no, this didn't bother anybody before. Now, why does it bother them now? You know, <laughs> or why doesn't this bother them now? You know, why have they moved on from that? Why have they gone to something else? Yeah, definitely. Difficult. Yeah. It's kind of uh, an ongoing process. Uh, it is. It is exactly. Yeah. So, so you have to think yourself back into their heads, but you also have to then step out of it. You know, it's it's you know, which is true for all history. You know, you have to understand why people thought that slavery was okay, because for hundreds of years people thought that slavery was okay. So you've got to try and think why might that be. You know, not just condemn it, but that doesn't mean to say you have to stop Big there and not condemn it you know but you but in order to make sense of it you have to know why they thought it was all right you know why was it okay that women shouldn't have the vote why did why were the people who argued against that you know you've got to figure out what the arguments might be so that you can make those arguments on both sides yeah well, it's kind of like putting ourselves in other people's shoes and precisely try- Precisely. Yes, yeah, that's right. You've got to start that way, you know, because if you if you don't understand where they're coming from, then then you can't go any you can't really go any further. You know, you can't criticize properly or you can't expand what they're doing or you can't see what they haven't done, which is often just as interesting as what they have done. You know, you've got to be able to walk around in their shoes a bit. Yeah. Mm. So it's like that's the basics of understanding history. We got Absolutely. To from that. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Yeah, yeah, and it's just that in the Middle Ages, because of the haphazard survival of the material, we have it harder than you know modernists. I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, out of interest, um, are there any common reasons as to why like certain discussions flare up and then die down, or is it sort of very kind of case by case and ad hoc? No, I think it is case by case, Um, because sometimes it's to do with, you know, practical social circumstances or something politically that's come up or diplomatically that's come up or a response to a new text that people are reading, you know, something that's come in or a translation. So I I think it it does vary. Yes. Yeah, I think it. And again, that's that's the kind of fun part is thinking why you know why why at this time and yeah the, one of the things I've been doing with William is you know there are all sorts of questions about um you know they were rebuilding Notre Dame you know they were the building the, the old wooden cathedral and building basically the cathedral that's that's there today and there were so there are questions that come up um in in theologians groups of questions about things like um how high should you build things <laughs> and there was a great debate about whether, you know, just it, it's exactly, you know, was it was this just a vanity project? You know, these skyscrapers, they're just vanity projects, you know. And there's a th- I think it's Peter the, Char- Peter the Chanter who says, um, you th- you're building it so high because you think the devil can't climb? You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's so so all those issues about, you know, kind of whether these are just kind of, you know, whether they're, they're just kind of... Um, you know, penis substitutes, I suppose, you know, kind of what you want. Why, why is this fire higher? Or, you know, then the, 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 you know, the classic and famous questions about, you know, can you accept money from prostitutes to, to go to, you know, and that's precisely because it, it, at Notre Dame, it, it, sorry, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, yeah, I was confused about those two, but um, at the time, you know, the, 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 the prostitutes in Paris wanted to pay money towards the cathedral and, and the, the cathedral clergy had a real problem, you know, could we take it or couldn't we? You know, and this is just like, you know, universities and art galleries and all those sorts of things nowadays that's saying, well, can we take this money? What should we take it from? Can we do it? Can we not? You know, and so the discussion that they had to decide was, was prostitution physical labor? Was it actually hard work or was it just immoral (laughs) earnings? you know and and so ironically they don't take money from people who've gained money from usury but they will take money from prostitutes because they reckon it's actually pretty hard work <laughs> i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall on that discussion where um, exactly <laughs> Very solid. Yeah. 
<laughs> but you need to call, why, why are they discussing? Oh, yeah, because they're building the cathedral. They're, they're building the cathedral. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose it's like anything. It's, it's, it's a serious question, I suppose. You know, if you open up an art gallery and say, I don't know, like an arms or tobacco company wants to kind yeah. of fund it, it's yeah. a serious question. Like, you know, do you take the money and, you know, allow it to be open, but, you know, have their name on a plaque or something yep. versus, it, you know, not taking it and then, you know, maybe not even having the funding to continue the project. It's, yeah, it's yep. really interesting how these things kind of cycle around again. Yep. And I mean, you know, can't we use the money better than they can? You know, that's also an issue. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. You know, interesting because uh, they they put aside the, the scene of luxury to yes. feel like a children. Yes. yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. William William Wobben has a wonderful phrase. He he he. It's the latrina luxurie, which are, is the, the kind of latrina of luxury. And he's always for well, lettery, but luxury as well. And he's always worried that you can fall into the latrine of luxury. And it's really easy to fall into the latrine of luxury, but really quite hard to climb out again. <laughs> he's got lots of fantastically vivid examples you know that it, it would have been wonderful in a congregation because you just can't forget them you know they're, they're really wonderful examples i think yeah oh goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that that is a fantastic image um there are many gems that i've found um you know throughout the middle ages but i think that's going to be one of the best that i've had <laughs> to date <laughs> oh that is wonderful um yeah um, I suppose one thing which I'll be interested um, to also know as well is, I suppose with all these discussions going on, um, how did kind of the church at the top kind of respond to all of this and the fact that um, everything was becoming more kind of scholastic, that things were being published more and people were discussing issues, I suppose, you know, much more kind of freely in kind of open, established institutions. Oh, well, that's a very big question. Um, well, one of the ways they do it is, of course, by um, kind of taking the Paris theologians to their heart, you know, to use the Paris theologians as a kind of um, a research centre for to try to work out the answers to these questions so that the popes go, well, often the popes are trained in, in Paris as well, or certainly in universities. Um, but they also realize that they can use these masters to produce answers to questions and, and do that. Mm -hmm. um, the other answer of course is, is that, you know, somebody like John Bossy would say that what they do is they strengthen um, institutions like confession where you know you're made to go and tell your deepest thoughts and your greatest sins to one single person who represents the authority and can damn you you know well can't actually physically damn you but you know can, only can god can do that but um but you know can can ref refuse you absolution and so that means it's a great you know bossy's words an instrument of social control now you know other people other medievalists would say no psychologically this is fantastic because one of the difficult psychological things is carrying guilt and mm. confession as a way of you know people not having to carry guilt so in fact the church is benign but other other medievalists would say no no this is the church as kind of totalitarian institution mm. and you know what you think of that how you how you understand that balance uh, again that's one of the interesting things that you know everybody has to come to their answer themselves I think you know what do you, what do you think you're doing but it's always interesting reading the particularly the confessional material uh, and and trying to work out which angle you think it's coming from yeah. definitely yeah. definitely I think I think it's really interesting I remember um sort of learning about confession and the fact that you know it does on the surface seem like this sort of real sort of instrument of control and this example of how the church is growing so big. But again, there's a question of almost the sort of guilt versus shame culture and the fact that mm -hmm. by doing that, you know, people can get, you know, can get it off their chest what they've done mm -hmm. and then be, you know, and then do something which, you know, is penitential, but allows them to kind of suffer and therefore be relieved of that guilt. It's really interesting mm -hmm. how there's that kind of, yeah, there's that sort of interesting kind of... Oh, sorry, Carlos. Uh, I was saying uh, it was kind of like an, an ex spiritual release, you know, something. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, you know, what, how you judge that is is how what you think of the church's motives. 
you know, and 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 I think you know one of the things we have to be careful about that is thinking that the church exists and that the church has one motive, or one set of motives, and and not that the church itself is made up with a lot of people who have various political agendas, and that those political agendas are in the ascendancy or not in the ascendancy, depending on time, place, and people. You know, so it's not there isn't a simple, straightforward answer to the question. I think. Mm, definitely. I think um, if tonight's demonstration is anything, it's the fact that it was probably more of a conversation than a sort of monolithic institution. And I suppose mm. rather than, you know, this sort of one set of sort of cardinals in sort of closed rooms, sort of consensually agreeing to something and then just kind of imposing it from the top down, it's almost as if people were for the first time, like really seriously grappling with questions and yeah, trying to sort of get to answers which would work and would allow them to fulfill that pastoral role but yeah sort of understand what was really going on and I suppose yeah there's this sort of conversation and debate and things like that. Well I'm, I'm sure the people who work on the early church would tell you you know kind of oh these things were being debated before now but you know we're as medievalists we can we can see it happen rather well. Um, uh, maybe as a sort of last thing I should I should give you a, a debate at the same time and it's another William of Orvan story but um, William was very anti pluralism you know people are holding more benefices simultaneously he thought this was wrong and when he became bishop he started a campaign that to outlaw pluralism and it's outlawed by Lateran four but it's still happening you know so well when William's bishop the person who's chancellor of the diocese of Paris is a man called Philip Philip chancellor and clearly Philip absolutely hated William really didn't and one of the reasons for that is he wanted his own nephew to be bishop um, when William was elected and so he seems never to have really forgiven William for being elected when his nephew who is also called Philip wasn't elected and Philip the Chancellor is known nowadays for writing a whole pile of motets, really well thought of motets. And one of them is called something like oh, hypocritical pseudo bishop. And it's clearly referring to William. You know, he's, it's clearly a sort of nasty musical jab at William. So the story goes that um, Philip is on his deathbed and William goes to see him and says, well, Philip, you know, this is your last chance. Um, renounce your your benefices give up your benefices and you know god will forgive you and you'll be received into into heaven do that now before you die and philip says no i just don't believe you you know but i'm willing to offer a bet an experiment i'm going to die holding my ex extra benefices and um you know and we'll soon know which of us was right and which of us was wrong so the story then moves to the bishop's private chapel early in the morning and um, the, William is praying in front of the prédieu, and the lamp flickers and a ghostly figure comes into his chapel and it's Philip and Philip says well I'm here to tell you that you are right and I was <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Uh, uh, so yes <laughs> so philip might have written his motet but um you know william got his own back in the end <laughs> <laughs> oh that is extraordinary as much as i would love to continue just to continue discussing this for as long as we can um i'm afraid we're drawing towards the end of our hour which is more the pity because i'd love to hear more sort of anecdotes and discussions just like that um <laughs> i think i speak for all of us when i say leslie thank you so much for your time this evening it's been a really fascinating and thoroughly entertaining talk so thank you so much for that not at all and thank you very much for being interested in in the bible and biblical commentary i'm glad some people are great <laughs> fantastic and yeah to our audience uh, thank you very much for joining us we hope you'll join us in the next episode um but for now i'd like to bid everybody a very good evening um, and yeah, please do continue looking into um, the Bible and its study in the Middle Ages. Thank you very much and good night. Good night.